about moving out outside of Iran to, uh, I mean, and specifically to Saudi Arabia, but maybe there are other examples. And we, I want to get to Zakir Naik. We don't have too much time. We still have to get to Maurice Bukai and Zakir Naik. Those are both necessary stops. But if you look at Saudi Arabia, I mean, I don't know, someone who's skeptical or cynical could say, well, I mean, Saudi Arabia, you have this agenda of folks who have lots of money and there's a sort of prestige in funding the sort of scholarship that, I don't know, leads to glorifying Islam, celebrating Islam, championing Islam, making the Quran seem better than the Bible, defending mm. Islam against secular materialistic science. So you have, I don't know, some millionaires in Saudi Arabia who are donating large amounts of money, or maybe zakat money is going to this sort of uh, uh, project of uh, establishing a journal, establishing a YouTube channel, establishing a website. Uh, and so uh, do you see there in Saudi Arabia uh, more top down? Do you see more sort of foundations that are trying to uh, I think it used to be orient scholarship in this direction? I think it used to be like that. But right now, I think it's started to get changed. OK, it's more bottom okay. up is like like many other places, people in different different disciplines became interested in this topic, yeah, not yeah. necessarily because of the, I mean, the top down, I mean, the governmental supports or authority okay. support. But I think this is at that time probably used to be like that, like many other places, like in Iran, there was a competition actually, who gonna be the leader of the Muslim world, I think at that time. Yes. Yes. Once you go since pre-revolution, even very revolution of Iran, there are some ideas about that. I noticed some documents in Malaysia that the Shah of Iran, when he was in Malaysia, he wanted to promote the idea of Islamic League or Muslim Brotherhood. He had such ideas. And I published an article about this one. At the same time, King Faisal, he wanted to do the same. The same thing. And, okay. and Maurice Bukai emerged during the time of King Faisal, right? Yes. Many yes. people and, in and Bangladesh. Himself, I mean, if we shift to Bukai for a second, uh, Bukai himself was uh, in it was in Saudi Arabia. Was, wasn't he a physician to the royal family or? Royal family in, 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 uh, royal, in, in uh, uh, oh, I mean, first in Anwar Sadat, president of, I mean, Egypt, Egyptian uh, president Egypt. of okay. Sadat. And then it, it is said, to be honest, it is very hard for me to confirm this. It is okay. said that he was attached to royal family of Arabia, but people are still hesitant to say okay. exactly okay. this okay. one. Okay. But we know about Keith Moore that he was, yes, he was in a hospital. He worked for hospitals in Saudi Arabia. He worked with colleagues there, and they produce articles in a series of articles about medicine and Quran. So he was one of the main contributors. So okay. about Bukai, the story is, I think, yeah, he's, we should talk about it. Yeah, yes. I mean, how does Bukai become like present in every bookstore in the Islamic world, translated into so many languages? You mentioned, I think, reading a Persian version as a young oh, yeah. man of, of his work, the Bible, the Quran, and Science, originally written in French, of course, but soon translated into so many languages. I mean, why would this this fellow sort of a mystery? Uh, you know, I've watched the lecture on YouTube that you speak about in an article in your article that he gave in Chicago uh, yeah. with his very heavy French accent when speaking in English. I mean, I, how does this guy, it's not clear if he ever became a Muslim. You sort of suggest in your article that he didn't, I think, although some people say he did. But why is he more popular than the dozens of Muslim scholars who have worked on this topic exactly. that you mentioned? What's what's his story? I think, so first about his conversion to Islam. There has been debates whether he converted to Islam or not. Some people interviewed his wife to get, they didn't have any answer about this issue, tried to find his grave stone to find about this issue and so on. But the point is that in one interview that he had with Al Azhar University's magazine, and later this mag this report, this interview was translated into Persian uh, in 1980s. You know, one, once they ask about his ideas about Islam and Islamic principles, it says that he, Muhammad is a messenger of God, so which is Muhammad Rasulullah. So and. Uh, there is only one God. See, he clearly says this issue. If the if we rely on the in, on the interview text, we don't know. I mean, the and transcription of the interview. But if we rely on that one, probably he converted. Yeah, it like the interview, but yes. we don't know. But we don't know. But about the way he became very popular, I think one of the main reasons was that he minimized the Bible. 
That was the main. Okay, you know? so he brings them together. Not only elevates the Quran, but also brings down the Bible. And this is this. He's a strategy. I think very. Well, I mean, uh, I don't know the way he minimized the Bible. But you know, the problem was that the people at that time there was, you know, the media was silent about others people working on science and religious texts. They didn't know about David Macht that they, he did the great job with the Bible and science. And plenty of other, you know, scientists who wrote about the Quran, about the Bible and science. So Maurice Bukai. So let me let me ask a very frank question, Majid, about Maurice Bukai. I we read mm -hmm. Bukai with my students at Notre Dame, mm -hmm. and I have a few Muslim students, but mostly mostly non-Muslim, mostly Christian, and most of those are Catholics. And a lot of them, because it's a it's a required course to do theology, so a lot of them are coming from the sciences, and they sit in my classroom. Um, there was actually, I had a Muslim student from the, from the Gulf, from the Abu Dhabi, I think, last year, and there was some conflict in the class because overwhelmingly the students read Maurice Bukai, my students, and they find it very weak, just so weak. I mean, so he says, I don't know, Surah Tal Ankabut, Surah 29, it says um, the, the spider's house is the weakest of houses or something. And then he writes something about, oh, this scientifically proves because we now know that the the fabric of a of a of a spider's web is such and such, and they they just find this like, is this serious scholarship? Like anyone could say that. Like there's there's not there's no science here. So how is it that a not non my non-Muslim students? Uh, so I said very frank question. My non-Muslim students are so unimpressed by Bukai. And he's so sensationally impressive in so many places in the Islamic world. I mean, I don't think all Muslims are. There must be people who don't like him and feel like there are more sophisticated ways to speak about the Quran and science. But I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there because of my experience here at Notre Dame. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I think, yes. Uh, the, the, uh, some aspects of that is about description of some elements, natural elements in the Quran. But on the other hand, he wants, for example, hydrology. He want to talk about the circulation of water. He refers specifically to the verses of the Quran. And then he put forward some his, he, he, historical information. For example, he says that the idea of circulation of water, for example, in the West, we have it after the 15th and 16th centuries. But what Quran says, for example, let me see. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, chapter 23, Surah Al-Mu'minun, uh, verse 18. So this is what he says that, for example, they, uh, that uh, he clearly says that we sent down rain from the sky in perfect measure and then as, uh, and uh, causing it to soak into the earth and we surely able to take it away. So he considered it as a circulation of water and in, in, in related to the science of hydrology. For, and because this is the point, he created context. He says that this one established in Europe after 16 or 17th century. Yeah. So, bef but you look at the Quran that it says long time ago. So this this comparison, you know, encouraging the people who are admirers of the Quran to support this idea. Okay. But I want to say this: if you go through the works of David Mach. Uh, and other Christians or Jews who wrote about the Bible and Quran or Talmudic literature, uh, sorry, ta the Bible and science or Talmudic literature and science, you can see similarities. They had the same concern. Similar too. styles of arguing. Okay. Very okay. similar. And that makes sense. Because that also, sense. you know, that uh, Maurice Bukai wrote something against blashers and uh, uh, oh, translations. Yeah. He often, yeah, um, yeah, I think uh, Hamidullah, right? Muhammad Hamidullah. Hamidullah. The Pakistani, Pakistani so this happened for even in, in biblical literature. I mean, David Mach also did the same. And yeah, he, you have to change a translation. Yeah. yeah. Like there's a famous debate over his bit about, oh, about the fluids of the man and the woman mixing and what it comes from the ribs. But he says, oh, that word it doesn't actually mean ribs. It has to mean something. So he does. Yeah, he does a lot of work with the translation to advance his arguments. Um, because there's not that much time, I wanted to ask you specifically about an anecdote you relate in the article about another Western scholar who, um, it seems, did not intentionally seek to advance 
scientific miracle arguments in regard to the Quran. This is Alfred Krona. I don't yeah. know if I'm saying his name right. Uh, and you and your Alfred article. Krona. Can you say it? I, I think in German is Alfred Krona. Okay. Okay. So uh, that guy. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. Just, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. So in that, uh, in the article, you you mentioned that he became exceptionally popular in Islamic media websites, things, uh, because of a lecture he gave in 1979 in Saudi Arabia. And it seems from your conversation with him, because you spoke to him, I think in 2016, yeah. um, that he was kind of surprised that he became so popular. Could you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. I, I can, you know, I remember that whenever I, I mean, all, I mean, he was very common in YouTube channels. And, uh, uh, as Zindani, Sheikh Az Zandani, I mean, he also interpreted his comments into Arabic and his ideas and his, I mean, the video of Sheikh Az Zandani and Zindani on the ideas of Corona, uh, after Alfred uh, was, I mean, commonly used by people, I mean, I mean, conversion agencies in Europe who wanted to convert non Muslim to Islam. Mm -hmm. Writing and his idea, and he received plenty of emails from his friends, and he was really sad about this issue. To be honest, I can't. He died a few years ago. I mean, unfortunately, but he, I have his email and the way he answered me, and so this he said that in 1979, with a, a number of geologists, they visited, I mean, Saudi Arabia, because they were invited by. Uh, let me. I have a note here. Uh, attended a, a geological conference in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and there was a television interview with five Western geologists organized by the Minister of Religious Affairs who had a PhD in geology. The issue was whether the Quran was compatible with modern views on the evolution of the earth. As you can imagine, there are always aspects in religious writings that are compatible with nature and the Quran is, and the Quran is not exception. The citation that you now find on these religious sites, like the one that is wrote, I mean, admired by Sheikh Landani, are taken out of context. I cannot even remember details of the interview. In any case, whatever you find on these sites are surely never said as it is coded now. There is little I can do about it. I asked several friends in the Islamic world for advice. So it means that he was not happy with this issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they all said just to leave it and leave with it. But the point is that it happened to Muris Bukai. You know that once Muris Bukai wrote that book, many people assumed that and they call her as a scientist and they showed the S of scientist with the sign of dollar, US dollar. And they said that he received huge amount of money, mm -hmm. oil money to wrote that book. We don't, to write that book. We don't know about this issue, about the accuracy because these were the, the people like him or Keith Moore. He tried to contact him. Mm -hmm. He never responded back. So, they are silent about what had happened in, 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 at that time. But the point is that this is the, 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 the many people who engaged with this project in 1970s and 80s. Many of them started to say that this is not actually the, the, the whole story. The okay. whole story is okay. different. And there were some ideas to take part of these, I mean, statements and attach them to the discourse of the Quran and science promotion of Quran in uh, Mindava programs. So interesting, Majid. I'm so sorry, but I think, I think we should wrap things up for now. I really hope we can convince you to come back to exploring the Quran and the Bible. I want to just remind uh, the audience uh, of two of your books, um, which uh, the first one is on a figure whom we've spoken about in this interview, Tantawi uh, Johari in the Quran, uh, that's published by Routledge in 2018. Um, and uh, Terrific book, uh, which we're going to get to, I hope, in a subsequent interview, Studying the Quran in the Muslim Academy. Uh, that's with Oxford University in 2020. Uh, and find these three articles. Uh, they may be on academia. Is that right? The articles? Yes, I, I placed them on academia. Yeah. But the Zayden Journal is going to be an open access source since gen from January. So it's going to be open access holy. Perfect. Available. Okay. So again, look for Majid. Majid Danishgar on Academia to find those articles titled The Quran and Science uh, in their three parts. You'll see them all there. Uh, incredibly interesting has, you know, it, as you mentioned during the interview, you don't simply revisit the, 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 the characters who are well known, but introduce uh, new aspects from diverse elements of the Islamic world far outside of 
you know, the countries that we usually hear about, Egypt and Saudi Arabia, you speak about the Malay, Malay, Indonesian world, uh, Iran, uh, all sorts of uh, South, South Asian contexts as well. So, uh, yeah, can very briefly before we wrap up, do you have a current project or future projects that we should know about? Well, in, I mean, in Quranic projects, if I want to say, uh, we, I, I, I'm, I've been working on my new book, which is about Vansbrew. It is about the whole story of Vansbrew and his life, his library, his uh, Quranic studies project, and the aftermath of its publication. So it's supposed to be a critical work. And so adding new information about him, his library, and the way he had influence on different corners of the world. Great. And the other one is about the, uh, Thomas Erpenius, the 17th century Dutch Arabist. Super exciting projects. Wonderful. Majid, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed our, our conversation. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Cheers. Yeah.